episode of Myeloma Crowd Radio, a show that connects patients with myeloma researchers. I'm your host, Jenny Alstrom. We'd like to thank our episode sponsor, Takeda Oncology, for their support of this Myeloma Crowd Radio show program. Now, it's unusual for us to have back-to-back shows, but today, as well as yesterday, I want to wish everybody a Happy New Year. Uh, We have some wonderful plans for the new year, and we'll be introducing several new programs. Now, the theme at the Health Tree Foundation in 2022 is one of change. We think that if a COVID vaccine can be developed in 18 months, we can change and improve the way that cures are developed, especially for multiple myeloma. And we already know that there's exciting change happening with the development of new myeloma treatment options, and we will be hearing about one of those new options today. Health Tree's goal is to help change the pace of myeloma research, by providing myeloma researchers free access to Health Tree Cure Hub real-world data that now has over 10,000 of you participating. Uh, researchers can use Health Tree Cure Hub to run surveys or studies or just dig into the real-world experience of patients through the anonymized data. For example, that data could be used instead of using a control arm in a study, making sure all patients get that trial arm treatment. Now, as far as we know, um, it's the world's largest and most comprehensive myeloma patient data set available. In addition to helping advance research by participating as a a patient, you can also benefit by finding treatment options, seeing crowdsourced side effect solutions, participating in the forums, and finding personalized clinical trials. And you can join HealthTree Cure Hub at healthtree.org. This year, we're also launching a Change for Change initiative where you can donate spare change and round up to the nearest dollar for everyday debit card types of purchases, and you can learn more about that on MyelomaCrowd.org. So now on to today's show. Um, Today's show is another new myeloma therapy called Engineered Toxin Bodies, and we are excited to learn about this from the primary investigator on this study, Dr. Shaji Kumar at the Mayo Clinic. So Dr. Kumar, welcome to the program. Hi, Jenny. Um, Good good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, Thank you so much for having me on this call. Oh, thank you so much for joining. Um, Let me give an introduction for you before we get started. Uh, Dr. Kumar was named the Mark and Judy Mullins Professor of Hematologic Malignancies Endowment in 2020. He's on the editorial advisory boards for The Lancet, Clinical Oncology News, Advances in Therapy, and is currently Associate Editor for the American Journal of Hematology. He's a board member of the European Journal of Clinical and Medical Oncology and the Leukemia Journal, and is a member of the Institutional Review Board at the Mayo Clinic, which is the governing body for all Mayo Clinic clinical trials. His clinical practice work includes stem cell transplant, the myeloma clinic work, and the Mayo Clinic CAR T-cell therapy program. Dr. Kumar's research focuses on the development of new treatments in myeloma, primarily in Phase one or Phase two studies. He also performs research on combination myeloma therapies, the bone marrow microenvironment, high-risk myeloma, amyloidosis, and the progression a precursor conditions like MGUS and smoldering myeloma to active myeloma. Um, additionally, I just want to mention he's simply the nicest person you will ever meet. <laughs> so, thank you, Jenny. I think that's probably the best part of that <laughs> introduction. So thank you. <laughs> you are. You are the nicest. Okay. So um, let's get started. Um, so, th- you know, it's so fun to hear about these new therapies in myeloma. We already know about the bispecifics, and they're kind of on their way, and CAR T is on its way. And um, so hearing about these brand new things that we haven't really, don't have any experience with is really fun. So maybe you can give a little background on this new therapy by molecular templates. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Jenny. So, so you know, we, there are a lot of advances being made in myeloma. As Jenny just mentioned, we have Obviously, the bispecific, hopefully, one of them will be in the clinic fairly soon, and we'll have a second copy in the clinic, hopefully, in the next few months. So, obviously, very excited about those highly effective treatments. But knowing what we know about myeloma, I think we always need to have different ways to try and uh, get rid of these myeloma cells, especially the ones that become resistant to uh, the treatments that we have uh, currently. So we're always looking for new mechanisms of actions um, or new types of therapies um, to deal with this. So we all know about you know, the antibodies that are uh, conjugated to or attached to various kinds of uh, toxins. So we all started off with just the antibodies themselves, like um, which all of you are familiar with, like 
to etumumab or ipetuximab, like the Dyslex or Farclesa, the trait names. Um, those are just the antibodies, right? So they recognize the myeloma cell because of the protein on their surface um, and uh, utilize the existing immune mechanisms to try and get rid of the myeloma cells. Now, we take it up one step further by adding some a toxin or a poison to the antibody, uh, which is what we have in the clinic, like um, Belandamat Mofidotin or Blendrap, uh, which has been approved. Um, in that particular situation, we are taking an antibody that recognizes a protein or um, a protein on the surface of the myeloma cell, and then the antibody is linked to a, a poison, which then gets into the cell and kills the cell. Now, the engineered toxin bodies are um, different in that it doesn't really use a ender antibody that's linked to the uh, poison. Instead, we're just using um, the, the part of the antibody that is responsible for recognizing the protein on the cell surface. So it's basically a piece of that antibody which is artificially generated um, or kind of linked to this um, poison. So the, the particular one that we um, presented some early results uh, at the ASH meeting, um, again, this is called uh, NTO169, um, that one actually uses um, a, uh, a protein that recognizes the CD38, which we know is present on all the myeloma cells, and that is the target for Darcelex and Sarcesa, um molecule that recognizes the 38, and then another half of that, which is basically a uh, toxin which is produced by the same bacteria that cause, you know, it's a shigella. Um, and um, basically that toxin is linked to this. Um, so you basically have a single protein that both recognizes and also have a toxin activity. So that is what we studied. Um, again, this is very early study, phase one, just started treating a few patients to see if this is what is, would be a right dose. Um, for this particular um, uh, molecule. Okay, I think I need. I might need a little more explanation about how it works because I understand the antibody drug conjugates like Blenrap and stuff. That you you right. talked about that that it's delivering this toxic payload, right, and then dumping yes. it into the cell. So you're linking it more, or I, I'm not sure I understand how that works. Right. So basically, instead of having that entire antibody molecule or the immunoglobulin molecule. Um, like what we have in Belandamab. So it's basically, if you mm -hmm. look at the blend drop, it is like uh, you take a poison, um, which in this case in, in blend drop is MMAF, and also basically link that to, let's say, an antibody like Darslex, uh, except that mm -hmm. in blend drop it is recognizing a different protein, BCMA, instead of the CD38 right. like Darslex. Mm -hmm. So here what we're doing is... Um, we are just taking that antigen or protein recognition piece of the antibody, um, mm -hmm. um, and it, it is synthetically, you know, uh, created, um, and it is it's basically um, what we call a single chain fragment um, of the antibody that recognizes that. In which case, here it is CD38, and then it is linked to a engineered mm -hmm. toxin. Um, mm -hmm. which, which is similar to what is seen in the Shigella bacteria. So basically what it does is poke holes in these uh, cells. Um, so that single chain piece which recognizes CD38 brings the toxin into the cell and then basically that toxin then does what it usually does in the cell, which is uh, killing mm -hmm. them. Yeah, so it's more of a, you're linking to that recognition piece of that. Correct. that. Part of the so it's basically a very small, it's a small uh, protein compared to using an entire antibody. Oh, interesting. So has ETB work or engineered toxin body work been done in other cancers or um, other blood cancers, solid tumor cancers, anything like that? Yeah, there are uh, others. There are other studies that are ongoing. There's none that is approved right now for any of the cancers which uses this particular platform. Um, so it's very early on, um, and I know there are studies that are ongoing, and I think believe in prostate cancer and others, um, as well as in lymphoma. Um, but here, this particular one, you know, targeting CD38, is specifically um, focused on the myeloma population. 
Mm-hmm. And CD38, because it, maybe you want to give a little bit of background. Cause, yeah, definitely. You know, so I think CD38, that'd be nice. CD38, um, you know, it's present on all the myeloma cells, and it's usually present in pretty high intensity. And that is the same and also less by sarcoma. Um, so CD38, we don't really know what the true function of that particular protein is, but it is present in a variety of cells, particularly in the myeloma cells. Um, with, uh, you know, and it's present at very high density, so the antibodies can very effectively bind to the CD38. Um, on the and that's an excellent way to target the myeloma cells or plasma mm-hmm. cells. Because it's, and they're not. It's not necessarily on a lot of normal cells, which is why it's a good target. Or because you always, you know, I hear investigators talk about that all the time. You have to find good targets that are no, right. not so a lot of normal some, cells, so you're not damaging things. Correct. So CD38 is present on some normal cells too, but it's uh, the the most intensity of that is in the on the myeloma cells. So unlike something like um, you know, for example, what we use in elotizumab or Emplicity, which is the SLAM S7, which tends to be primarily on the myeloma cells and maybe some what we call natural killer cells, uh, the CD38 can be found um, in some other on some other tissue as well. But the intensity is what matters. And the myeloma cells have some of the highest intensity of the CD38, so they they are likely to be much much more targeted compared to normal cells, um, and hence it's unlikely to cause you know unintended, unintended harm to the normal cells. Mm-hmm. And I know patients who are on isotuximab or daratumumab, um, some of them can relapse after that. Do you do we know um, what's the cause of relapse? Is it a loss of CD38 or like, because I wonder how um, that will affect this treatment at the same time. Yeah, that's a very good question. So there are multiple mechanisms through which uh, myeloma cells escape treatment. One of them, especially with the antibodies, is to get rid of the protein that the antibody is targeting. Now, that mm-hmm. does not seem to be the major mechanism why patients stop responding to Darslex or Sarcasa, because most of these myeloma cells at the time of relapse still have um, CD38 on them. So it seems there are other mechanisms in play, maybe some of the immune mechanisms through which Darslex works um, is is what is getting shut down rather than really the expression of CD38. Now, having said Hmm. that, uh, we do see that CD38 just become a little bit dimmer on those cells at the time of relapse, and when you check them later on, they seem to be brighter. Now, what we don't know for sure is how much of that is related to um, the, um, you know, the the dark legs or the surplus are being bound to the CD38, and hence the assays are not optimal. Um, But there are also uh, uh, some examples of patients, myeloma cells, completely losing CD38, but it's very, very uncommon. Oh, okay. So there are other ways which might mean it's you still have the target to go after with a new therapy going right. after it in a completely different way, yeah. Exactly. Okay, um, well, maybe give us a little bit of background on this. I think this originally was a joint venture with Takeda Oncology, and now um, Molecular Templates is a different company, kind of moving it forward on their own, right? That is correct. Originally, it started off as a collaborative development, and for reasons which are unclear to me at this point in time, it seems like molecule templates taken on the entire responsibility for moving this molecule forward, and the phase one trials are ongoing right now. Mm-hmm. And that was my next question. Like, what, what phase of trial is this? And I think you might want to take a few minutes to explain um, just phase one, two, and three trials and how they work and what their objectives are, just um, in case people don't aren't familiar Absolutely, with that. Absolutely, yeah. No, it's a, it's a very interesting um, journey that these drugs take uh, from the time when they are first identified or discovered to the point where they are used in the clinic. Um, it's, um, it can also can be quite expensive and also can take a lot of time. And those time frames have shrunk in the recent years as we have more and more technology uh, to, um, you know, more and more different clinical trial designs as well as um, ability to accrue patients faster. Now, so the, or, the first time um, when you identify a molecule, sometimes these molecules can be 
developed with a specific target in mind. A good example is you would have probably heard about venetoclax in myeloma. Um, and that molecule was originally you know, synthesized um, specifically to target BCL2 protein in the uh, tumor cells, knowing that BCL2 is very important for cell survival. Now, some of the drugs are identified because there's, you, know, you screen a whole bunch of drugs and you come up with one uh, that seem to work better. And there are plenty of examples of that um, in, the, in the clinic, um, you know, including drugs like the Ravlamid and um, Velcade and so forth, which have come out of, again, screening experiments of multiple different drugs that have been developed uh, to either to target a particular um, mechanism or um, they look similar to something else that seemed to have worked in the past. And then you screen them against a lot of different cell lines. And cell lines are basically um, cells which can grow, um, which are derived from the tumor that can grow in a petri dish. So you take those cell lines, you uh, apply these multiple different compounds to those cell lines and find out which ones work the best. And then you take the, the best candidates forward and do more experiments trying to understand how best do they work and do they work better alone or do they work better in combination with other drugs. And you do all those work on cell lines. And then you take the promising ones to look at you know, the tumor cells that come out of, um, again, the bone marrow biopsies that are done on patients. So many of you on the call may have uh, donated some of those tumor cells for clinical research and those cells get used um, to in, in assays where these uh, potential future drugs are um, uh, are applied to. And then you find that some of these ones work better in those tumor cells then we then take them into animal studies where we might use small animals um, to see uh, does it work outside the petri dish. Um, and once we feel like we have a molecule or a set of molecules that has significant efficacy against the tumor cells, then we, uh, then we have to do a whole series of what we call large animal studies, which are often, again, sometimes in dogs, sometimes in um, chimpanzees, you know, um, yeah. a variety of different models are chosen depending upon the particular drug and the way that is metabolized by the body. But the intent is to try and see what would be the type of side effects we should anticipate once we move into human studies. Now, based on what the findings from those animal studies, then we do the phase one trials. So these are the trials designed to um, understand what can be the side effects in humans and what would be the ideal dose for a particular molecule to move forward. And this is really the kind of the transition between just having a molecule in the lab to actually having a drug in the clinic. Those phase one studies often start with very, very low doses of these medications, and we um, have there are a variety of different designs that can be used where you might either treat three patients. If they look good, we treat three more patients at a dose, and if everything looks good, then we go up to a next higher dose and treat six patients and so forth. There are also designs which can look at you know, the data from one patient at a time at each dose, what we call accelerated titration designs, where you can actually you know, have um, move ahead much faster looking at a set of data, both in terms of side effects and also what the blood levels or the uh, ability of the molecule to hit the target that we are going after. So either way, the whole goal of that phase one part of the study is to identify, one, what are the toxicities that we are seeing, and two, what is the best dose to move ahead to see if it is something that is effective. But we will also get a good sense is whether this a drug has efficacy. So let's say we treat you know, 20 or 30 patients on a phase one study, and we start seeing some patients are starting to respond or the myeloma is actually getting um, going down with treatment, then we know that we have something that's probably a promising thing um, before we move on to the phase two portion of the study. So the second phase of the study, the primary objective of the second phase of the study is to um, understand what kind of efficacy are we looking at. Is it at the, at the dose that we decided is safe to use? Is it 30% of the patients who are going to respond? Is it going to be 60% of the patients? Are there certain sub 
groups of patients who might respond better. So, for example, with the venetoclax, if you have a translocation 11, 14 myeloma, we know that those patients would respond better. With a particular monoclonal antibody, maybe a subgroup of patients where the myeloma cells have high expression of that target, they may respond better. So it tells us the overall efficacy, but also gives us some early ideas as to whether there are subtypes of myeloma that might benefit. Now, once we get through that phase two portion, and we know that uh, this particular drug X can bond in, let's say, 50% of the myeloma um, patients that were treated, and remember, these phase one and the phase two studies are often done in patients where other treatments have stopped working. And, mm -hmm. um, and so once we get a sense of what is the efficacy and what groups of patients the drug works, then we look at phase three trials. Now, primary objective of the phase three trial is to demonstrate that a particular drug either used by itself or in combination with the ongoing or a current standard treatment is better than the standard treatment. So, so, th so this is a, uh, these are randomized trials where patients are, you know, um, assigned to one treatment, which is either the standard treatment or the experimental treatment by the flip of the coin. That's what's called randomization. Um, and um, to see, you know, if the new drug is, uh, is adds anything to the current approaches that we use in myeloma. And then this will hopefully, you know, lead to the approval of a new drug if that shows benefit compared to what we have. Now, for approvals, in the gold standard for all these clinical trials is to have a phase three trial that shows that, you know, a drug is better than what we already have. However, they can take quite a bit of time. And if we already see that a drug can be quite effective in the phase two trial, we want to try and get those drugs to the patient sooner than the phase three trials results come out. And that is a, a pathway that has been used for a lot of myeloma therapies, what we call an accelerated drug approval that the FDA has put in place. So if you treat a significant sizable number of patients with the relapsed myeloma who really don't have very many options um, with this new drug, and we see that a significant number of them have now responded to treatment and have um, uh, lived beyond what you would have anticipated without that drug being there, then um, the FDA is, uh, often allows accelerated approval of that drug so we can use it in the clinic with the understanding that a phase three confirmatory trial is ongoing that will you know, give you the definitive proof that this is indeed a good new effective drug. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, there are studies which are often referred to as phase four or post-marketing studies. Um, those are to collect more experience with the drug once it's approved and it is in the clinic. And the FDA mandates um, a lot of the pharmaceutical companies to do that so that you know, we can understand what happens when these drugs are used in patients who might not have been able to get on clinical trials. As you all know um, very well, there are a lot of clinical trials which are hard to get into because you don't check all the marks. And um, it may be because your white blood count is a little low or your platelets are a little low. And we also want to know how these new drugs work for those patients in the real world setting. And these phase four trials, one allows us to, um, to define those. And the second is, you know, even though these phase three trials are large, there's still limited number of patients. So if you have a side effect that occurs maybe one in a thousand times, uh, a 600, patient phase three trial, nobody might have it. But you might start mm -hmm. noticing it right. once you have 10,000 patients treated with that drug. So that's the importance of having those phase four or post-marketing trials. And you're seeing how things work in the real world. And that process that you just described, I mean, I think I've heard it said that the average is like 17 years. <laughs> but maybe that's, yeah. uh, maybe you have a different number. But yeah, the average is a lot longer, but uh, Jenny, I think the good thing is those numbers are getting shorter and shorter. So, you yeah. know, I think with some of these newer therapies, they have gone from definitely at least from the big first patient on the phase one study to being in the clinic at about four to five years now. Yeah, it's amazing. And I think what you mentioned about phase two, um, after phase two, some of these myeloma drugs being approved is really like a, a radical idea that the FDA has um 
has been using, I think, to have to go ahead and get it out there into the clinic and then, you know, because these trials seem like, I mean, you're waiting years to get results sometimes from these trials. Absolutely. So how long it's do we need to wait? To, it's great. Yeah, Jenny, but uh, the bird, of course, means that it is a double-edged sword as well. There is some element of risk, right? The best example mm-hmm. is the uh, the PAX store, the Melflufen that was just withdrawn from right. the market, mm-hmm. which was approved based on the phase two studies. Um, but when you did the phase three trial, it seemed like not all patients benefit, and in fact, some patients might be harmed. So, mm-hmm. so yes, there is a uh, element of risk, um, and I think FDA is continuing to optimize that process to decrease that element further. Yeah, well, that was yeah, that was so interesting because it was used a little, and then you know they didn't have the right confirmatory right. data. Right. So good that they're watching it and took action. Okay, um, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit more about this um, study. So this is a phase one study, and um, was there data presented on this at ASH? Yeah, so it was more in terms of a trial in progress. So you know, we just oh, okay. uh, looking at what type of patients um, uh, are going to be going on the clinical trial. So right now. Um, there's only a handful, under 10 patients who have been treated so far. Um, with some of the, um, you know, we, with the early phases, we have to be very careful with every single side effects um, to make sure it is not related to that. So um, at this point, the trial is kind of working through that process um, of going, looking at the side effects that have been seen so far, and then trying to go up to the next dose level uh, with the drug mm-hmm. so that... Um, that we can we can continue to learn on it. Mhm. And then, um, have you seen because you're looking at dosing and you're looking at side effects, like you mentioned, have you seen any you know certain side effects that you see with this therapy? Or, and um, I don't recall how this therapy is given. I guess. I guess that's one of my other questions. Yeah, so we don't really have a lot of, unfortunately, not a lot of data um, on mm-hmm. the, you know, it's, it, as I said, when you have a handful of patients, and these are right, patients small. who have kind of had most of the myeloma treatments have, you know, low counts to start with, how much of that is related to myeloma versus how much of it is related to the drug becomes really hard to tease out. So I think as we have, hopefully, in the next year, to year and a half, as we finish up the phase one study, I think we'll have a good sense of um, what this drug um, can do for myeloma. And, the, you know, this particular sugar toxin um, that um, is being used has been studied not in NASA ETB, but also as in other formats, in other cancers, and has in the previous studies been associated with um, um, some increased leakiness of blood vessels, um, you know, what we call a capillary leak-like syndrome. Um, but, hmm, again, okay. we haven't seen any of that yet in this setting. But uh, that is something which um, we have to be carefully watching out for. Okay, great. And then um, how many patients are needed in this Phase one trial? Because usually it's so just a small one, number of patients for Phase one, right? That is right. Um, the Phase one study, um, you know, it all depends on where we start seeing those um, uh, side effects, right? So we keep adding... Um, the six patients at each level, we are hoping that we should be able to get this done um, with about somewhere between 30 to 50 patients. Mm. Okay. That seems like sort of a big trial for a phase one study. Yeah, it, it could be lower too if it starts seeing some if it, you know, side effects at a lower dose level. It certainly could be. Wherever we determine that it's going to be the best phase two dose, and I didn't talk about this before, is often based on the fact that you don't see more um, side effect that would limit the use of the drug in uh, in one or less patients uh, among uh, six patients. If you mm-hmm. see, you know, um, three side effects or three patients with that kind of side effect, then obviously we have to go to a lower dose. Hmm. Okay. And um, where, uh, well, first, how is this, is this an IV medication, or how is this administered, and then how frequently, and how many cycles do you go on it forever? Do you stop after a certain time? How how do you receive this type of treatment? 
Um, so you mean you mean the schedule of the treatment? Yes. Uh huh. So it's basically um, the the patients are getting uh, the treatments uh, IV, um, and there are two different schedules that are being explored. There's one that is being is looking at weekly schedule, and there's also one that is looking at every other week schedule. Um, so uh, in addition to the uh, dose, so right now um, what is happening is we're looking at the uh, the weekly scheduling weekly schedule dose, and once we get to a point um, where we think um, it, we have reached the effective dose, we will also start looking at the every other week and see if we can go at a higher dose given every other week to see if uh, you know the convenience of dosing can be explored further. Yeah, that would be nicer for patients if they don't have side effects right. that are going to impact them. Mm -hmm. And then is this something you just stay on for until relapse, or um, is it something that's given for a certain period of time and you stop? Or um, So right now the treatment is um, designed to be continued until the disease starts progressing, which is often mm -hmm. the way we uh, do these early right. phase trials. Right, that's common. In myeloma. Okay. And where is the trial open? Is it just open at the Mayo Clinic or other locations? Uh, there are other locations, too. So we have uh, it open at um, both the Mayo sites, Rochester and Jacksonville. It's also open at Vanderbilt, and I believe they're also exploring some other institutions to open this up, too. Mm -hmm. And um, let's talk about daratumumab for a minute, because um, yeah. when I was trying to do some research for the show, it seemed like it could either be used in patients that were refractory to daratumumab or even maybe combined with daratumumab, which I thought was super interesting. Um, so, you know, I think it's, yes, um, there are, you know, a variety of different trials now, right, that are looking at combining with daratumumab. Um, and they, I think we are looking at the daratumumab as a very good platform um, Again, because of the efficacy we have seen um, and not a lot of hematological side effects, so that allows it to be combined with a variety of different drugs, including the other immunotherapies. Um, so, for example, there was you know um, there was data presented on a uh, different type of drug, the TAC 981, um, um, which is again it's, it's more of trying to stimulate the immune system in a different way, and we are trying to combine that with um, uh, targeting the CD38. There was data presented at ASH looking at the bispecific agents like uh, the teclistimab and the talcutimab, which are basically mm -hmm. the new immunotherapies that are kind of redirecting the T cells to the myeloma cells, and there are, they are being combined with uh, uh, teratumumab in the relapse setting. So hopefully these studies will allow us to move that even forward to the point where some of these new immunotherapies like bispecifics can be combined with teratumumab in newly diagnosed myeloma. Mm -hmm. And, I, well, I just think it's so interesting because it's going after the, the same target, CD38, that you could use this in, um, or could you, let me just ask, could you use this in patients that are refractory or, you know, stopped using teratumumab because it stopped working for them? Sure. Sorry, I maybe I misunderstood your question earlier. Yeah, no, um, absolutely. So since, as, as you mentioned before, I mean, since this is a totally different mechanism of action, um, it's quite possible that this would work in somebody who has become refractory to dratumumab. Um, you know, once we figure out what is the right dose of the drug and make sure that it actually, you know, the activity is, is good. Um, so we already know, um, you know, we don't have a lot of examples of um, CD38, one way of targeting CD38 followed by another way of targeting CD38. Mm -hmm. so we know for sure if you do the same way, like for example, if you use sarclisa in somebody where the myeloma is stopped responding to dratumumab or vice versa, it's not really very effective. However, um, you know there are now um, uh, CAR T cells that are looking at CD38, and there are also other um, approaches like what we are employing here. Um, going after the CD38 with a different mechanism. Again, not a lot of data, but it suggests that suggestion would be, I mean, at least we can extrapolate from the existing data that it's likely to work. 
but I would say the best data would be, you know, again, there was some data, uh, data presented as ASH from Mount Sinai where they looked at people who were having the myeloma come back after some of the BCMA-targeted uh, immunotherapies. Um, mm. uh, and when those patients were getting a different type um, of treatment that is still targeting BCMA, there were patients who were benefiting from that. So I think there's a good chance, um, high probability, that going after the same target but using different mechanisms would be beneficial. Yeah, so interesting. Um, can you explain, because there are different arms in this trial, right? Can you explain the different arms of the trial? Right. So this one, um, you know, there's obviously um, there's the dose escalation portion, uh, which is basically looking at the increasing um, uh, or trying to identify the maximum tolerated dose. So that's the part one. Um, and then it, there's the part two, which is what would you call a dose expansion phase. Um, that's where we would take the phase one dose that we deem to be um, effective and start treating more patients um, with that particular uh, dose. But then we also including several subgroups of patients. So we are going to be looking at patients who are refractory to deratimumab. We're also going to look at a subgroup of 18 patients who have previously not received a deratimumab-like drug. And there's also going to be a group of patients with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And this kind of expansion will happen both at the once week and also at the once every other week dosing. So they're not really, um, you know, it's not like patients are being um, assigned to a particular arm. It's just almost sequential in nature. Right. So if you have the relapse after daratumumab, you can join the study, I guess, is Correct. the comment. Because you have arm. part of an, yeah, you have an arm of that that allows that. So that's going to be interesting because then you'll have an early indication of whether that's true or not. True, exactly. Yeah. Um, what type of patients are the best candidates for this type of therapy? Like how many prior lines of therapy do they have to have? or So who can join and who can not join? Right. So right now the phase one portion of the trial um, is, is, is basically um, – for patients with, who have relapsed refractory multiple myeloma, who at least have received you know, one proteasome inhibitor, one immunomodulatory drug like Revlimid, and has had at least um, three previous uh, lines of therapy. And so that, in that way, it's fairly open. And again, the goal here is to look at patients where um, the, other, the available therapies that we know can provide benefit and stop doing that. Okay. And this trial I also was reading um, is also for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. What, why lymphoma, I guess? Yeah, so the expression of the uh, CD38 um, can also be seen in some non-Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma um, uh, cells. Um, and in fact, there are trials ongoing that are looking at deratumumab in that patient population as well. Okay. Um so I know that everything starts, you know, as a single agent in a clinical trial. You're testing safety and you're testing the dose, and and you talked a little bit about combining it with other things. Is there any indication um, that other standard of care myeloma therapies, like you talked about a little bit about the um, immunotherapies, but that it might be particularly effective with anything else like the IMEDs or um, – I mean, you probably don't know that yet, but I'm yeah, just wondering what patient. other type of clinical yeah. trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so not for this trial. I think uh, for this particular molecule, yeah. the future design is going to depend a lot on what we find, um, mm. especially the aspect of, you know, of course, you know, knowing that there's a dose that can be safely given that is effective is probably going to be the most important. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, seeing what efficacy are we seeing in patients who have become refractory to deratumumab that's going to be a key differentiator that will help us design the future trials. Um, the, um, uh, but, but other ongoing trials, you know, out there um, looking at immunotherapies are specifically um, you know, looking at the immunomodulatory drugs because they seem like a natural partner for many of these drugs, like the Revlimid and the pomodoromide, because they overall tend to improve the immune system. So, um, so those tend to be the earliest 
candidates to be evaluated in combination with uh, monoclonal antibodies, just like what was done with ritumumab and rapamycin or ritumumab and pomidogamide. Mm, okay. Yeah, and um, it it looks like well, since it's so new and hasn't been used in a lot of other um, types of cancers before, um, but it sounded you know you don't have a lot of experience with this, but it seems like this is like a type of technology that you could use with other type of targets. So, what other type of targets in myeloma could this technology be used for? Yeah, that's a good question, and I'm not sure if I know the correct answer to that and because again and this is probably something more proprietary to the development uh, pipeline um i'm not aware of an another myeloma um target that they are exploring at this point i think they are looking at other you know, multiple different cancers um but certainly the platform seems to be fairly you know open or um, capable of employing different targets so i think we know the what are the good targets in myeloma um, you know we know that mm-hmm. dcma is good you know so the rate is good there are trials looking at the slam f7 there are other molecules like what we call cd229 fcrh5 uh, gpr gprc5d the whole slew of them are out there which we know are good targets for myeloma if any of them are specifically being explored by the company i really don't know jenny yeah okay that's interesting um Okay, I'm trying to think. Well, you know, I sometimes this is so new that I don't know even what questions to ask. <laughs> so, is is there anything else about ETBs in general that that you think would be helpful for patients to understand? You know, I think the key thing, you know, it's just like any other phase one study. I think, you know, going back to the whole concept of how we develop studies, um Mm-hmm. One thing I always tell patients, yes, in a lot of the, one of the differences between a lot of the solid tumor phase one studies and what we do in myeloma is, um, of course, we want to try and use these new new uh, drugs in clinical trials um, as early as possible. Um, and sometimes it's it's reasonable to consider trying one of these trials with uh, an exciting new platform knowing that there might be other options that we could always go back to um or even reuse some of the treatments from the past um for treating myeloma so just going on one of these phase one studies doesn't mean there's no nothing else that we can do afterwards so. mhm yeah well it's i mean this is such a busy space it seems like and so it's it's so fun to listen to a brand new therapy especially uh, because we know like sometimes the CD838 target is a great target, right? Some of yep. these drugs, sertumumab and isotuximab are being are very effective and helping a lot of patients to extend life and things and um we want to keep that going. Well, I yep. want to open it up for caller questions um to give it a few minutes for that. So if you have a question for Dr. Kumar, you can call um 3476372631 and press 1 on your keypad and it looks like we have one caller question at 7507091 first um go ahead with your question I did not have a question at this time I'm sorry Oh okay Well if you have a question you can push 1 on your keypad that flags me <laughs> So you have a question. Okay. I think we have one more question. Okay, 4148174. Go ahead. Um, doctor, I have have multiple myeloma cancer, and I have done a treatment with uh, dexamethasone and revlimid, and I just I discontinued that about nine months ago. Would I be eligible for this type of a trial at this point? So it depends on what all treatments you have had. As I said uh, before, like this particular one, you would have had to have you know three different types of treatments. 
in the past that have stopped working. Okay, then can you answer me? Are there other types of immunotherapy out there that have been approved for multiple myeloma that I would be eligible for? And how would I find that out? Right, so I can tell you more about, I mean, there are multiple different immunotherapies that are out there, both uh, approved and in clinical trials. So there are, you know, obviously the CAR T that's approved. We have um, a second uh, CAR T that probably will be approved in the next few months. We talked about the bispecific antibodies that are all going through clinical trials. Now, it's hard for me to tell you exactly which one you would be eligible for you know, without knowing all the details about your clinical history. But if you need to find out which trial you could potentially be uh, eligible for, I'm sure Jenny can guide you, provide you with some resources that Health3 has. There's also the clinicaltrials.gov and a variety of other resources out there. Yes, so um, if you want to email me at info at healthtree.org, I can walk you through the process to find different clinical trials that you would personally be eligible for um, because we have that functionality in the HealthTree Care Hub software. And that was healthtree.com to email? Just info at healthtree.org. Org, not com. Health tree. I repeat that. So yeah, health tree dot org. Mm-hmm. Health tree dot org. And do I specifically how can I address that to that you get? Um, to? you can just address it to me, Jenny. Jenny. And I'll get back to you. Mm-hmm. All right. Thank you. Yep. Sure thing. Okay, we have one more caller question. Um, six five two eight two three three. Go ahead with your question. Hi, um, excuse me. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> so sorry, you have a cold. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, what is the best way to go about joining a clinical trial like this, especially if the trial is not held in my regular, <laughs> sorry, in my regular treatment center? Yeah, so you would have to be seen at the center where a clinical trial is being done. And unfortunately, with most of the clinical trials, that means you would have to, um, at least for the for the duration of the trial, transfer your care to that institution where you're joining the clinical trial. Because most of these, especially these early phase trials, the medication cannot be sent out and they have to be administered at the center. So somebody would basically like find out where this where this trial is being held and then call that center and say, can I become a patient or can you see if I'm eligible? Um, exactly. Just kind of what's the process, I think, of that, uh, of yes, just calling the center and getting that set up? Yeah, so you should be able to, again, you know, um, every center works differently, but most of them you should be able to go online and reach out to the appointment uh, area um, and provide some, you know, very basic uh, information and they will get back to you um, to find out what details would be needed to set up an appointment or at least determine if a particular trial would be, um, uh, you would be eligible for a particular trial. Okay. Thank you. And we hope you get better soon. (laughs) Thank you. I think... I, I think so much is going around. It's so crazy. Um, yes. Well, Dr. Kumar, thank you so much for taking the time to explain these engineered toxin, bo- tox- toxin bodies or toxic bodies. ETBs, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, with us, ETB. So I guess we can just say that. Um, I think the work you're doing to create new therapies in multiple myeloma is truly wonderful and um, very much appreciated by the whole patient community. Um, you know, we might have one more question, and I think we have enough time. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, no, actually we don't. Okay, um, anyway, I just want to say thank you for participating, and um, thank you for everything you're doing in terms of getting these therapies out to multiple myeloma patients. We're just so appreciative for you. Thank you, And thank you for listening to today's Myeloma Crowd Radio Show. We invite you to join us next time to learn more about what's happening in myeloma research and what it means for you.
Step into the world of power, loyalty, and luck. I'm going to make him an offer he can't refuse. With family, cannolis, and spins mean everything. Now, you want to get mixed up in the family business. Introducing The Godfather at ChompaCasino.com. Test your luck in the shadowy world of the Godfather slot. Someday, I will call upon you to do a service for me. Play the Godfather, now at ChumpaCasino.com. Welcome to the family. VDW Group, no purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. See terms and conditions, 18 plus.